Father Weta is um, a published writer, a surfer, a teacher, a coach, professional juggler, a gardener, a rugby player, an uh, archaeologist, a rosary maker, an icon painter, a carnivorous plant botanist, and he has worked just about every job imaginable from archaeologist to beach lifeguard to street performer. He, his wit and youthfulness are per perhaps uh, most evident qualities, but those who know him would surely add that he has a passion for Catholic orthodoxy, literature, and his writing. So after graduating from Rice University, Father Augustine went to work um, on archaeological digs in Italy and Greece, and then a year studying ancient language at the University of Pennsylvania, which led him to the University of Missouri, where he intended to pursue a PhD in classics, but instead he found a call to be a Benedictine monk. He took solemn vows in January of 2000 and was ordained to the priesthood in 2003, and he comes to us from um, the Priory. His talk tonight is called Lent, A Time to Fail. Father Weta. Okay, so um, I'll begin with a couple of disclaimers. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut said, a great speaker never begins with an apology, but that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Uh, firstly, I played 18 years of rugby, which is about 17 years longer than anyone should play rugby. And as a result, I, I got so many concussions, the right side of my body shakes. So if I do like this, you're not in trouble, and I'm not angry. <laughs> And you don't have to wave back, it's just me. Uh, the second thing is, I wrote this book and uh, it went viral. And uh, I've given so many of these talks now, I've forgotten where I've been and where I haven't. Um, so if, I, if you remember me speaking here, could you raise your hand and I'll just two, three. Okay, good, I'm gonna try not to repeat myself. <laughs> um, I just, that gives me a sense of what I should and shouldn't say. Thank you. Um, well then, let's, let's just jump right in. Uh, our help is in the name of God, who made heaven and earth. God our Father, grant us the fortitude to be faithful, loving Catholics, the humility to walk that path in truth, and the serenity to do it with joy. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So two Sundays ago, uh, the first reading for Mass was for the call of Elijah. And I know this reading extremely well because that was the first reading at the Mass at which I took my solemn vows. On January 1st, 2000 at 9 a.m., which means I am the first monk of this millennium, unless some jerk in the Cook's Islands got there first. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he didn't because there are no monasteries there. Uh, at any rate, I remember the reading vividly because um, it, it goes on about Elijah's call and this is, the, the, the word of God is bitter in my mouth, then it became sweet and so on and so forth. But the lector at that mass left out the crucial last sentence, <laughs> which was, here I am, send me. Which is kind of the whole point of the, <laughs> the narrative. Uh, Elijah's being called, he wants to be called. And I chose that reading because I wanted God to send me. Fast forward 19 years, and I find myself smiling condescendingly on that young monk who would dare to make such a demand of God. And there have been times when I questioned the wisdom of the decision I made that day. Knowing how hard the life of a prophet can be, why would anyone volunteer for it? Now the gospel reading at that mass also played a large part in my discernment of my vocation. 
at a crucial moment during my novitiate when I was certain that the monastery was not for me, I had a very vivid daydream. This is not in itself unusual. I spend most of my life daydreaming. But on this occasion, I had been reading about the call of St. Peter, and I imagined that I too was on the beach that day at Gennesaret. And I too was packing up my fishing nets and tackle. And when I looked up the beach, there was Jesus. You can see where this is going, right? He was walking along the shore in my direction. He was choosing his apostles. So on he came, and he was walking toward me. And as he grew closer, I could see the look in his eyes. He was walking straight towards me, and he came closer. And just as he got to my boat, he stopped, and he turned, and he chose the guy in the boat next to me and walked away. And I might have interpreted this as a sign that I was not called to the priesthood. Had I felt relieved, I'd say I wasn't. But instead, I became quite convinced of the opposite. I rebooted the daydream and ran after Jesus, calling, wait, wait, you forgot me. Choose me. Here I am. Send me. Now, this has been a hard few years to be a priest. In fact, it's been a hard few years to be a Catholic. And in fact, it's been the hardest year for us yet at St. Louis Abbey. But I knew when I signed up that we might have a hard go of it. I was told we were likely to lose men. I was warned that the life of a Christian was not easy and that I would find myself on the front lines of a war for souls. I was told that every soldier, when he comes face to face with the enemy, questions his decision to fight. But a good soldier knows that for the sake of his brothers in arms, he must stand his ground. I was sharing this with some of my students a couple of weeks ago. One of them said, look, I know the monks are like the green berets of the church, all right, but this is like Black Hawk Down or something. <laughs> and it feels like that. But you know, there were guys who deliberately parachuted into that fight. Knowing the odds, they deliberately put themselves in harm's way. They wanted to be there at that burning helicopter. And I believe those men were heroes. So here we are, monks and lay people alike, in the thick of it. The pressure is, frankly, unbearable. And the enemy has us surrounded. And some of us are very discouraged. Some of my monks have run away. And some have simply cracked under the pressure of it. But I told my students, and I've told my brother monks, and I can surely speak for some of you too, when I say there is nowhere in the world I would rather be right now. You all parachuted in on a Friday night, and I am grateful. My father's a historian, and he sent me a speech by Winston Churchill. Not a great theologian, probably not a saint, but a great soul nonetheless, a steadfast soul. A soul who, when it looked like his people were likely to lose heart, gave a speech which steeled their resolve. And I find myself rereading this speech in a new context. And I'll read it here with you. He said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We should prepare ourselves for hard and heavy tidings. And I have only to add that nothing which may happen in this battle 
can in any way relieve us of our duty to defend the cause to which we have vowed ourselves. Nor should it destroy our confidence in our power to make our way through disaster and through grief to the ultimate defeat of our enemy. And when we see the originality of malice, the ingenuity of aggression, which our enemy displays, we may certainly prepare ourselves for every kind of brutal and treacherous maneuver, but at the same time, I hope, with a steadfast eye. For even though many have fallen, or may fall into the grip of the enemy, and all the odious apparatus of his rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength. We shall defend our home, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landings. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Or to put it in more biblical terms, do not be afraid. So you'll pardon me if I repeat one story that I told, I think, the last time I was here. We'll begin with repentance and then talk about failure. St. Benedict says, if anyone in his chapter on 40, in chapter 46 of the rule called How to Fail, St. Benedict says, if anyone makes a serious mistake or beha behaves in some other way, let him tell a spiritual father who knows how to heal his own wo wounds and not make public the faults of others. He also advises in the same chapter that when you notice your brother is offended, you throw yourself on the floor and beg for a blessing. Uh, every monastery is a microcosm of the larger church. And uh, so we have fat monks and skinny monks and dumb monks and smart monks and in, uh, ingenuous monks and hardworking monks and lazy monks. And, and every monastery has a crazy monk. Uh, Every monastery, only one, because you can really only handle one crazy monk. But our crazy monk was Brother Edward Dahlheimer. And by crazy, I mean he had invisible animals in his room that talked to him. Uh, in, and he was, I think, what they call obsessive compulsive. Everything had to be exactly correct when he came into choir. All his books were lined up at right angles. His, when he came into dinner, he, li he spent about 10 minutes lining up his forks and knives. When he died, we went into his room and he had the furniture glued to the floor. There was a lamp glued to his desk. Pictures were glued to the wall. There was a pencil glued to the table so it would always be where he needed it. Uh, now, at the same time, Brother Ed was a great genius. At the age of, I think, 82, he taught himself to play the harmonica because he was a fan of bluegrass and blues. Uh, he didn't know how to read music, so he invented his own notation based on colors. In, in the archives, we have volumes of books that are just lines of color. No one knows what they mean, but they're bluegrass music. Over 500 tunes he transcribed into this invented language of his. And he, he was an authority also on Ernest Hemingway. In fact, he had, he owned personally a first edition signed copy of The Sun Also Rises. I asked him if I could see it once. And he said, never. <laughs> because, brother, I, I am not obsessive compulsive. Uh, I, I am so consistently late for everything that my confrontators have begun to call me the late Father Augustine. <laughs> and, and everything in my room is in a big pile. And, and I'm a mess. And I forget, uh, I forget to do everything. That's why I forgot what I had already told you today. And, and to make matters worse, 
Brother Ed had to sit next to me in choir four times a day for eight years. Um, so we didn't, we, we didn't get along. <laughs> and when you, when you don't get along with someone in a monastery as strict as mine, you have to have a very quiet fight. Um, I don't even know if I should say this, but once or twice, I may have rearranged his books. <laughs> and he had his own way. He once threw away all of my rugby equipment. And then, to make matters worse, the abbot made me the kitchen master and made him the dishwasher. Yeah. If he wasn't crazy at the beginning, he was definitely crazy by the end. And... Uh, Honestly, I was probably the worst kitchen master St. Louis Abbey had ever seen. In fact, I, there were times when no one ate. <laughs> and it's a testament to these men, their virtue, that they never complained. And so I never remembered. Anyway, the abbot decided I was more of a scholar than a kitchen master, and so he sent me off to Oxford to do my theology studies. And as a thank you to the monks for their great patience, I made a big feast for the monks, and the, the crowning achievement of which was a chocolate almond tort that my mother had taught me how to cook. And it's just basically a whole bunch of chocolate and almonds that you grind up, pack together, and bake, and it's amazing. And I made three chocolate torts, knowing full well that the monks could only eat two of them. Uh, and so I took the third and I hid it in the refrigerator and I cut a piece off for myself to eat the next morning and I wrapped it in silver foil and I hid it behind the mayonnaise because if you want to hide something in a monastic refrigerator that no one touches the mayonnaise and and I left it there for the next morning I woke up extra early and I got my cup of coffee and my favorite book and I put a chair on the back porch looking out over the cloister and I went to the fridge and I got my chocolate tort, my piece of chocolate tort, and I went to sit down, and when I unwrapped it, someone had been there first. In fact, someone had carefully unwrapped the silver foil, taken a bite out of it, put it back in the silver foil, wrapped it exactly as I had wrapped it, and left it in the exact space and there was only one man capable of that kind of meticulous insensitivity. <laughs> and the depths of rage that welled up, but I, I pushed it back down, and I calmed down, and I went and I cut myself another piece of chocolate tort, wrapped it in silver foil, put it in the fridge behind the mayonnaise, but first I soaked it in Lee and Pepper's super hot Cajun sauce. <laughs> and the next morning, when I came into the kitchen, there was chocolate tort sprayed on the refrigerator door. It was, it was arguably the greatest moment of my life. <laughs> Vengeance was mine. And, and once or twice, you know, if I pass Brother Ed in the hall, I, I might go. Because <laughs> you have to have very quiet arguments in a monastery. Anyhow, I went off to Oxford for a couple of years. And while I was in Oxford, the, um, Brother Ed got cancer. And he died. Now, monks wear black for a reason. St. Benedict says that a monk should hourly consider the moment of his death, should reflect on that every day, every hour, should remind himself that he may die at any moment. And I think this is why, because I got to start thinking about his death and my death, and I started thinking, well, you know, I, I could have made him his own chocolate tort, Right? I mean, it was a piece of chocolate cake, for crying out loud. Wrap two pieces of chocolate tort and leave it with his name on it. And Anyway, so I felt pretty bad when I came back to the monastery and Brother Ed wasn't there. 
But when I got to my room, there was a little brown paper package on my desk. Sorry, this is the part where I get choked up. There was a little brown paper package on my desk, and it was carefully taped and tied in twine. When I untied it and opened it, it was Brother Ed's copy of The Sun Also Rises with a little note that said, sorry, right? So on Ash Wednesday, we're all called to remember what monks are to remember every hour, that we're dust, and to dust we shall return. And these little things that become so big in our lives, well, they're really nothing compared to that great inevitability. At, uh, right around the time I took my solemn vows, my sister took her marriage vows. And she asked me to give the toast at her wedding. And I, the, I went to one of the Sen Pecte, the old hearts, as I often do, um, Abbot Patrick, who was asleep in the calefactory that's monkish for a living room. And I asked him what I should tell my sister on her wedding day for her toast. And he said, oh, you tell her that there will come a day when she will want the window open and he will want the window closed. And then he went back to sleep. And I, I, it took me years to figure out what he meant. I did give that as her toast and everybody thought I was great. But I had no idea what I was talking about until a few years ago, I was telling this story to the missionaries of charity, who I love to tease. Nothing's better than teasing a missionary of charity. They, they all look like this. Even the Americans, they end up looking like this. And they say, oh, Father, you're so funny. Anyway, I told them this story, and one of them told me a story. She said, oh, that makes perfect sense. When I was assigned to the Amazon, who gets assigned to the Amazon? She, she said, I lived in a shack with four nuns, four missionaries, and one of them was a local. And every night she would come in before bed and close all the windows in the door. And we would steam quietly all night till the next morning, right? And the one thing we wanted more than anything was just to open one of those windows. But no one said a word. And finally, by some great act of divine mercy, this nun was transferred and they opened up all the windows and, and they had the first pleasant night's sleep in years and woke up the next morning with snakes in their beds. <laughs> right, because, <laughs> because this nun had been looking out for them the whole time, but none had bothered to ask. Right? St. Benedict talks about mutual obedience, right? That you trust the people you love. You trust the people you live with. For that matter, you trust the people you don't love, just by default. I, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm way off course now. I, I, just, I left the script like 10 minutes ago. But I, I, I've been thinking, I, I've been reading a bunch of psychology books lately because I've been thinking about decision making, and there's this incredible cool concept called um, the fundamental attribution error. Anybody? No, good. You haven't heard of it. It's, it. it's a big word, but it's the idea is that when I do something kind of shady, I judge myself based on the circumstances. Right? If I cut in line in the grocery store, it's because there's an emergency, or I'm in a terrible rush, or I've had a hard day. If someone else cuts in line, he's a jerk. Right? So you apply a different criteria to other people's actions than you do to your own. Right? Or another way to put it is, when you're on the highway, everybody who passes you is a maniac, and everybody slower than you is a moron, but you have picked the exact right speed. Right? How is that even possible? But ch so charity, it turns out, makes just good psychological sense. But this is why we need repentance. Right? St. Benedict says that a monk, when he is, when he, the second he notices that his brother is, is angry, he throws himself on the floor. Right? And I, I've done this, I do this so often 
that my brethren are, are kind of annoyed by it now. Um, but it works. I, um, not, too many, not too long ago, I, get, I told a joke in the faculty room at Priory, uh, which didn't go over well. And one of the, the teachers came up to me and she said, uh, I find that really offensive. And I panicked, so I threw myself on the floor and begged for a blessing. And she went, it's my fault. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> Fastest I've ever won an argument. And the beauty of it is you don't even have to feel sorry. Right? I, tell, I tell the kid, because you're not looking at them. Right? But, the and, and, but, but the other beauty of it is that people tend to get angry, I think, because when you anger them, it's because you've stolen some of their dignity somehow. You, you've, you've taken a piece of it. So by making yourself small like that, you give them back their dignity. And then you ask for a gift even. But all this, all this comes under the mantle of obedience. When I was, um, you can even do apologies wrong, right? I mean, we've heard, God, how many apologies have we heard politicians say, actors say, I'm really sorry if someone was offended by what I might have done when I was provoked. The, um, during my, well, when I, when I first joined St. Louis Abbey, I made a resolve to never have another lustful thought, which lasted all of about seven minutes. So I decided to put that off till my novitiate, and uh, I met with equal failure there. Uh, but in the course of my novitiate, I read the biography of St. Francis, and we all know what St. Francis did when he was struggling with lustful thoughts, right? He threw himself in a rose bush. So, thinking if it worked for St. Francis, <laughs> why not give it a, a shot, right? Um, there, ha there were several rose bushes in the cloister. <laughs> so I walked out there and threw myself right in forgetting, two, well, three really essential points. Um, one of which is that St. Francis threw himself into a wild rose bush, which has significantly smaller thorns. <laughs> two, that uh, St. Francis was a saint, and it made a lot of sense for him, but for the rest of us, it's just stupid. And three, that St. Francis was naked when he threw himself in the bush. So he didn't get stuck. And although I was in there for m maybe 15, 20 minutes tops, it felt like hours. And un unluckily, it was my novice master who passed by. And I mean, he passed right by <laughs> and returned with the rest of the community. And after they'd had a good laugh, and helped me out of the rose bush, he explained to me that before you attempt any further acts of ascetic heroism, consult your spiritual director, right? I mean, we can even do our penance wrong. We can even fail when it comes to our penance. A friend of mine in high school, uh, no, grade, uh, what was he? We must have been sixth grade, um, so not quite high school at all, um, took up smoking for Lent because his father smoked and he hated it. <laughs> so he would go down to the basement every day and smoke a cigarette. And his parents caught him and he got in trouble. And he, 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 for years after that, he was like, I can't even do penance right. Like, I can't even do Lent right. right? There, in, the, in, in the monastery, we have, um, well, we share everything, obviously. And, uh, and we do our own laundry, and we have a communal laundry room and a communal iron and ironing board. And one afternoon, and, and that, we're constantly breaking the iron, right? Because you drop it or whatever, and we're constantly getting new irons. Um, it, but this one time I went in there, and I was about to iron my scapular. I picked up the iron, and it fell apart. Like literally, the bottom fell off, the water spilled out, the button fell onto the foot, because someone had come along and dropped the iron, 
and then pieced it back together again and balanced it on the ironing board so the next guy would think he broke the iron, right? And again, you're maybe learning too much about my life in the monastery, but again, I was really peeved because I was the one who was gonna to have to apologize to the prior for breaking the iron. So I made a snarky announcement after dinner when it was time for that sort of thing about to the effect that someone had left the iron pieced together on the iron board, blah, blah. And immediately after dinner, old father Rafe came up to me with this look of genuine apology in his eyes. It turned out he had broken the iron and pieced it back together thinking he was gluing it together, but in fact, he was using eye drops. <laughs> so far, I haven't even gotten to my talk. <laughs> Let's go with failure then. This is, uh, my first book was on humility, as you probably guess. Uh, I gave myself an award for my humility, so I'm qualified. Uh, my second book is going to be on failure for e reasons maybe equally obvious. Um, and this is, how, this is how I want to start it. In one of the great scenes of Western literature, the enraged warrior Achilles, who is unbeatable, stands outside his tent on the beach of Troy while three ambassadors beg him to rejoin the battle. Right? And Achilles, who is unmoved by their appeals, answers, I hate that man like the gates of death who says one thing but hides another in his heart. So I'll say this straight, will Agamemnon win me over? Not for all the world. Not now that he has torn my honor from my hands. It's this shockingly powerful passage, and also heart-wrenching, but, but somewhat confusing as well, because we have to ask ourselves as, as moderns, how do you steal someone's honor? How do you take someone's honor from their hands? Well, scholars have written volumes about this, uh, but the long and short of it is this. The Greeks of the Bronze Age measured their honor in stuff and in reputation, right? They called it time and kleos. Sometimes you hear it translated honor and glory. When they say all honor and glory to you, Lord, it's all time, all kleos to you, Lord. So time is measured in stuff. So the more stuff you have, the more honor. And if someone takes your stuff, they literally take that much honor. Someone stole a Greek hero's cow, they stole one cow's worth of honor. And similarly with kleos, or glory, it's determined by popular opinion. So if someone insulted a Greek warrior, he literally damaged his glory. So in Agamemnon, the general of the Greeks, steals Achilles' slave girl. He literally steals one slave worth of honor, and Achilles never gets over it. Because honor is a zero-sum game. The more of it Agamemnon gets, the less of it Achilles has. Now, the reason I open with this story is because I think Achilles has begun to make a comeback. Uh, I think as a culture, we've begun, again, to measure our honor in material, external things. And I think our kids are feeling the stress of it. But my purpose here is not to whine about how lousy the world has become, but rather to propose a few solutions, some antidotes. And I offer them in the form of four short stories. Well, actually five people, five saints, four stories. And as I move from one little story to the next, I want you to keep Homer's invincible hero Achilles in the back of your mind, okay? So the first failure I wanna start with is John the Baptist. He ate bugs. And I, I could stop there, really. I think I would have made a, a pretty good point. But he wore uncomfortable, unattractive homemade clothes. 
He died young and was, by his own admission, unworthy to fasten the sandals of the man who came after him. And when his own followers decided to abandon him, he said, well, I must decrease, so this one may increase. What a sad thing to say. Can you imagine any politician, movie star, superhero, CEO, saying something like that today? I must fail so Hillary can succeed. Like most of the prophets, John was murdered by the very people he was trying to help. And he was preparing them for a man they would eventually reject, humiliate, and execute in the most horrible way. And yet, Jesus himself said of this colossal failure that he was the greatest man born of woman. He's one of the few saints in the Roman calendar who has two feast days devoted exclusively to him. One is his birth. The other is, ironically, his beheading. All right, story number two. St. Simon and Jude. Here are two men who own nothing and about whom we know very little. St. Jude was confused with Judas so often he became the patron of lost causes. What's more, the gospel writers themselves couldn't seem to keep his name straight. John calls him Judas, but not the Iscariot. Luke calls him Jude, the brother of James. Matthew calls him Thaddeus. Nothing is said about him in any of the Gospels except that he asked one question, not a very good one. He says, Lord, what's this? That's John 14, 22. And that's it. There's a New Testament letter that bears his name, but most scholars agree that someone else probably wrote it for him. Now, we know even less about Simon. Mostly he goes by not Peter. Luke calls him Simon the Zealot. Matthew and Mark call him Simon the Canaanite. But he's pretty much referred to as not someone else. And that's it for Simon and Jude. They even have to share a feast day. And yet, they were chosen by Jesus himself to lead his church. Story number three. This one's my favorite, St. Edward the Confessor. Here we come upon a refreshing change of pace. Edward was a king. By the standards of the time, he was obscenely rich and singularly influential. However, he was, by most accounts, the worst politician in the history of Britain. King Edward, son of Ethelred the Unready, an unauspicious beginning, if ever there was one, <laughs> was weak, impotent, timid, and famously ugly. In worldly terms, a complete disappointment. During the course of his reign, Edward lost all of his kingdom's money without accumulating any political power. In fact, he allowed himself to be used as a puppet by, of all people, his in-laws. Then, when they were done with him, a pack of foreign con men took over. Furthermore, despite his marriage to an intelligent and beautiful woman, he never managed to produce an heir, which is the one thing even an incompetent monarch can usually pull off. Some claim that this was his choice because he secretly wanted to be a monk. Others claim it was his wife's choice because he was so ugly. Indeed, King Edward the Confessor left to history a reputation for weakness, indecision, financial incompetence, and yet he is England's most popular saint. He built the world's greatest monastery at Westminster, and to this day over a million people come every year to visit his tomb. And lastly, a local gal, St. Rose Philippine Duchenne. I alienated an entire church full of sisters with this one. 
but I, so I'll just confine myself to her biography, okay? I, not my words, the words of Marion T. Horvat, her biographer. She said of St. Philippine, the first order she entered closed. She did not feel realized in the second institution until she came to America to convert the Indians. Then instead of carrying out this long desired mission, she was ordered to teach girls and found convents. But the work was more difficult because she never learned to speak English. She founded a convent that failed, then another that foundered. The girls, she said, were ungrateful and worldly and the sisters asked her to leave. When she finally was permitted to go to work in an Indian mission, she was already 72 years old, too old to work or even learn the native language. But after only one year, she was denied even that great consolation. She was ordered to leave the Indian mission and return to Florissant, where she died, having converted exactly one Indian who apostatized. And yet, she was utterly faithful to her call as a missionary. She never gave up. And a century after her death, when the Jesuits finally showed up and did the job right, the Potawatomi Indians still remembered her as, oh, the woman that prayed. Now, saints like these would have baffled Achilles. Simon and Jude died without Time or Cleos. Edward squandered his political influence. John the Baptist had his head cut off. Rose Philippine died penniless and disappointed. No honor or glory there. Not by ancient Greek standards. In fact, these folks come up pretty short by our modern standards as well. You kind of have to wonder at the church's logic when it holds these people up as role models. And yet, that is the logic of the cross. A logic which redefines success, turns human wisdom on its head. In the light of the cross, failure becomes promise. Weakness becomes strength. The meek and the humble inherit the earth. This is why Nietzsche ridiculed Christianity as a religion of the weak. We come from a long line of failures. Sometimes we actually seem to take pride in that. Mother Teresa was asked if she could possibly hope to succeed in India when the poverty was so overwhelming. She answered simply, God does not expect us to be successful. He expects us to be faithful. This quote has become to mean a lot to me in my work, especially in my work in our high school, because in addition to my teaching and praying, I also coach the rugby team, which has not had a winning season in over 12 years. In fact, we only broke even once. We were four and four, and that year my players tore down the goalposts. Now, some might argue that a losing streak of that magnitude may have had something to do with my coaching. But I prefer to look at it in biblical terms. You see, God has a special affection for losers. We look at all the losers in the long, baffling history of our salvation, starting with the Israelites, whose finest king seemed to have a thing for other men's wives, and continuing right through the age of the apostles, whose first unanimous decision was to run away. To our own age, and people like St. Philippine Duchenne. So when it comes to losing, I am of the firm, op firm opinion that it is a sign of God's special affection for my team. For every failure reminds us that our beauty, our value, our integrity lie not in our accomplishments, but simply in our existence as sons and daughters of God. That said, 
Before I close, I, I need to make one point, one more point, which is that failure is bad. Like all forms of suffering, it is a consequence of original sin. And it is natural, even wise, to avoid failure whenever possible. But just as there is a tendency to romanticize suffering as though it were thought to be, or a thing to be sought out, you know, or worse yet, enjoyed, so there can be a tendency to romanticize failure as though it were just an alternative form of success. Like suffering, however, failure can be transfigured, enriched, elevated in the light of the cross, which was in its unique way the fusion of humanity's greatest failure with its greatest victory. So just as it was Christ's vocation to die on the cross, so we may be called by God to fail from time to time. In fact, I think it's fair to say that we will all inevitably be called to fail on some level. But the good news, with a capital G and a capital N, is that if we can remember to unite that failure with Christ's own suffering, it transforms into a tremendous good, not just an opportunity to grow, but a participation in the redemptive sufferings of Christ. We must also distinguish between failing and being a failure. A parallel can be drawn, I think, between sinning and being a sinner. When we say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, we don't mean to, by that to define ourselves by our sins. We're sinners, but our identity is in Christ. Right? Martin Luther used the analogy of a dunghill covered by snow. He said, we're all basically manure. But Jesus hides this from God beneath the snow of his grace. And that is dead wrong. Right? It's wrong because it does not acknowledge the fundamental goodness of God's creation. Our identity is in our goodness, not in our sinfulness. My best friend in grad school was a self-professed bitter ex-Catholic, and he used to say, the problem with you Catholics is that when you're happy, you're happy. And when you're miserable, then you're really happy. <laughs> well, that's true. And there's something really beautiful about the way Christianity can transform suffering into joy, which is why we look to saints like Edward and Philippine for inspiration. And why it's such a disappointment to hear people recite platitudes like, you can do anything so long as you put your mind to it. It's just not true. No one is omnipotent but God. I'll close with this little paragraph I wrote while I was listening to a valedictorian. I, I wrote my own valedictorian speech. Because I've heard so many of these. And it goes like this. Good evening. You are all going to fail. You all inevitably have your hearts broken. Experience loneliness. Miss a major opportunity. Lose a game. Lose a job. Lose a bunch of money. Be abandoned and ridiculed and humiliated and scorned. You are destined for failure. And that is very, very sad. But it's also okay. Because your God had his heart broken. And was ridiculed by his friends. Your God was humiliated and scorned and abandoned. And that means that your dignity is not bound up with your success. You are a child of God. You have been divinized. And in the end, when you lie on your deathbed, as we all inevitably do, without trophies or diplomas or accolades or even your bodily health to comfort you, all that will matter is your existence as a child of God. And it will be enough. That will be more than enough.
That will be everything. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.